She had the best laugh on the planet. Always love kids. She was so much fun. She was just a genuinely kind, sincere person. I could always tell Nan's anxiety rate based on the length of her phone calls. And sometimes they would hit straight two hours, except never when Steve was around. Stages the fire marshal's office says it is still working to determine what caused a deadly fire on Friday. There's a number of scientific things that we have to do. It is the well-known wife of a St. Tammany fire chief. So many people in this community have been hit hard by the tragic loss of Nanette Krentel. The 49-year-old's body was found in the charred remains of her home in Lacombe on July 14th. Something just didn't seem right to me. The news that Krentel died from a gunshot wound. That was what was shocking about it. Not the intense blaze that burned her Lacombe home to the ground came during her memorial service Friday. Completely caught off guard by it. It has not been easy. Our initial primary person of interest in the victim's husband has been cleared. And that is all I care about at this time, is to get an answer. She was murdered. Being threatened and afraid. How are they going to know where the hidden DVR is? We're not adding that. That was one of the spots we were told was heavily doused with accelerants. This is coming to a head. And that was caught by they surprise. Killed, killed, Too killed many her. things. She was afraid. Not done correctly. She was afraid. Well, we don't have to afraid. Man was scared to death of him. killed Nanette Krentel and burned down the house around her that she shared with her fire chief husband. Her family has wanted an answer to that question for the last two and a half years. The investigation has been as unusual as her death is mysterious, with the only arrest for someone criticizing how the St. Tammany Sheriff's Office handled the investigation. Over the next hour, we take you on our journey all the way to Sioux City, Iowa and beyond as we search for answers to what went wrong in an in-depth eyewitness investigation, Mystery in Ashes. Let's go. <laughs> Family dinners. <laughs> Dinero's the one that plays cars. It's a cute little place down there. And well, maybe we can do breakfast in the morning. I just have so much stuff that I spread it around the whole house. Well, you talk about life. Oh, thank you. Real life. $24 for two tickets. What life is. Dakota City. What you want it to be. Bourbon Street don't do it for me. What twisted hand life deals you. It's an amazing story. Isn't it? But the Watson family invited me to this family dinner nice to meet y'all in person <laughs> chicken parmigiana to talk about death there's a great quote from voltaire centuries old to the living you owe respect but to the dead you owe the truth murder really and so you know it's like why would you lie about that to us because the Watsons have lots of unanswered questions. How are they going to know that? What do you do with this? How, what kind of police work is that? Like who killed their daughter, sister, niece, friend, Nanette Krentel. The family of a North Shore woman Nanette found shot to death. Shot to death. Shot in the head home. in the rug of the couple's look home. home. Michael Covington area fire, fire chief Steve shot in her burned home in July. Murdered. And you think being the wife of the fire, fire chief, fire, 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 Dad called and said, Kim, Nanette's dead. And I just, what? And just immediately started screaming, they, they killed her. Pretty much just like this. Fire chief's wife tragically dies in a fire, or so everyone thought. The fire was Friday. We arrived Monday. And as soon as we pulled up, I pulled Kim aside. I said, this ain't right. This hasn't even, nobody's even investigated this. 
We're in, in the preliminary stages. Where You're in Louisiana. You don't have basements. We're just trying to determine the area of origin. It's a single story house. There, there is a number of scientific things that we have you to do. You don't die in the fire in the middle of a day when you sleep normal hours. Well, it looks at this scene, it's going to take us several days to do There's that. There's just no reason for you not to get out. One of the things that strikes me about today is the fact that the family was not told for nearly a week that Nanette had suffered a gunshot wound to the head. The news that Krentel died from a gunshot wound. Minutes before Nanette Krentel's funeral. Came during her memorial service Friday. Sorrow turned sinister. My cousin Gina had found an article that someone had leaked something. When news broke about the bullet. Right before you go into the memorial service. Yes, we all knew she had been shot in the head. And you found out through a blog. Yes. I immediately knew that she was killed. I apologize uh, for not giving them the heads up before they got the information from the media. Steve Krentel wouldn't talk on camera for this story, but he said, quote, that's the part that really bothered me was the way that came out. I was completely numb. I stayed numb for well over a month where I didn't really know what was going on. Is there any doubt in your mind that she was murdered? She was murdered, and I think brutally. And if you're not giving them the truth, why not? I think that's the questions that just keep lurking over everybody. Why not? Sheriff Randy Smith. Hey. Uh, Detective Buckner. How you doing? Well, we're doing good. We're getting some information out to you guys. The night of my sister's uh, memorial, Steve calls my brother and tells my brother that you are leaning towards suicide. I call you and I tell you that there is absolutely no way I would I would bet my only child that my sister would never, never shoot herself. And you tell me that women shoot themselves all the time. They shoot their children. They shoot their husbands. They, they can possibly shoot their pets. And so that's when I told you I did not trust you. A week after the fire, family members say Steve Krentel told them detectives suspected Nanette committed suicide. Did Sheriff Smith directly insinuate to you that he thought yes. this was a suicide, that yeah. Nanette had killed herself? To, to myself, Randy and Kim were also there, but we all three heard him say suicide. Two months after her death, St. Tammany coroner Dr. Charles Preston publicly declares Nanette's death a homicide. Later that day, Smith issues his own public statement saying, quote, at this time, the sheriff's office investigation does not necessarily support the coroner's conclusion in this case. Fast forward 24 hours. We have worked this case and will continue to work this case tirelessly and aggressively as a homicide, and we have since day one. It, it just, things just were not adding up. The Watsons worry investigators' early suspicion that Nanette committed suicide may have kept them off the trail of her killer. We have learned from sources close to the investigation that five high-ranking members of the sheriff's office in the weeks after her death met with Preston to make their case it was not a homicide. The coroner wouldn't budge. Two other autopsies would back him up, including one the Watsons commissioned. We're in a hotel room in Nebraska with Dr. Thomas Bennett. You went down and actually took a look at Nanette Krentel's remains. I did. This is his report. Basically, it says there are three main scientific reasons Nanette did not kill herself. Death is not instantaneous. Death is a process. If you have complete cessation of breathing, you still will have circulation for a period of five or six minutes. One, there was no soot in her lungs, not even microscopic particles of it, which Bennett says would have been present even if she took two breaths near the fire. Did she stop breathing before the fire started? She stopped breathing before the fire ever got to her. Two, her body didn't blister as it burned. Bennett says it's an indication the fire didn't reach her body until she was completely dead. And three, 
Bennett says he saw very little blood around Nanette's body in crime scene photos. A gunshot wound to the head would bleed copiously. Um, you would find a large area around this on the floor. With debris falling around, fires tend to burn up. So any of that blood that would be down there on the floor around here would be still present. But he didn't see it in the photos, and you don't see it here in this footage either. Meaning she could have been killed somewhere else, even hours before the fire, and her body moved to the master bathroom where she was found. We were able to conclude very easily that this was a homicide, not a suicide. Doug Johnson is a longtime homicide investigator in Iowa. He teaches classes on it, and he was with Dr. Bennett during their autopsy of Nanette's remains. What do you think about the possibility that she killed herself? Oh, I, I think it's impossible. We've spoken with a number of investigators familiar with the case who, to this day, still think there's a chance Nanette Krentel killed herself. I think the likelihood of her accidentally or intentionally taking her own life is zero. What would this dinner be like if, if she was sitting here? It'd be louder and there'd be more laughing. <laughs> yeah, if she had a laugh that you just awesome. Yeah, she'd catch herself like starting to laugh and then it would get louder. <laughs> But in recent years, behind Nanette's laughter was fear. It just seems like what she was telling us, she wasn't being heard. Heard by investigators, her family says, after the murder. Heard by her husband, before. I should have called her. I should have gone down there. I should have made her come up here. Mm. It was all too late. You see, Nanette was afraid to the point that she asked Steve to install extra security cameras around their Lacombe home. Why is it all of a sudden the cameras weren't working that day? Steve went out and bought several uh, guns, 20 gauge Remington for Nanette, uh, 12 gauge for himself, and they began practicing regularly. Family members say Nanette wanted Steve to protect her, causing friction in their marriage. And this is a statement she always made. As long as I have my guns and the cameras and I'm at home, I'm safe. Nanette was extremely um, level-headed. She was extremely, um, extremely smart. Lori Rando met Nanette Krentel in high school at Chappelle in Metairie. She could read people very well. She knew if somebody was, you know, genuine. They lost touch for a while. Now Lori lives outside of Houston, but Facebook brought them back together. When we first got back in into each other's lives, um, I had gone out to the property and um, spent a day with her and Steve, and it really was a great day. Um, we had gone four-wheeling around the property. Um, they had a, a creek that goes in the back of the property. They had a nice house, um, a big sign that said Crennel, but you would be very secluded back there. Really had no neighbors. are headed to the Crental property where the fire was, and it's pretty remote. She was very isolated back there. The house was like a fortress. And you can see that there's plenty of security around just by the number of cameras, uh, the fact that there is that locking gate that has to be activated for people to go in. And so this is a pretty secured site, if I've ever seen one. The yellow push pin marks where I'm standing on a Google Earth view of the Krentel's property. The closest house is a tenth of a mile away, and the Krentel's was surrounded by thick woods. There's another house on the property where Steve Krentel's cousin lives. 
there's his cousin's house. It's when you crazy. first drive in, the two houses are blocked off from the rest of the area. And if you, you go far enough back, you can see theirs, but you can't really see it from the, neighbor, from the cousin's house even. Other than the road, someone would have to go through the woods to get to the house. There's only one easy way in and out through the gate. So this gate also had video cameras on it, um, but apparently they stopped working the day before the fire. Once you go through the gate, you just seem to, to go on forever, but it's very desolate. So Steve's been really protective of the property since this whole thing happened uh, because things have gotten ugly between him and people who cared about Annette, people in the community, um, because of the cloud of suspicion that he's been under for two plus years now. He's asked us not to shoot on the property, and we, of course, have respected that, um, and that's why we're out here right now. There were just two ways into the house itself, through the front door and through the garage. There was a board that would kind of come over the back door to like you could put a board down, so like a lock wasn't even enough. There was a board that slid down to lock the back door as well as a normal um, lock. They recover some of the uh, dead bolts on the door locks. Uh, they were in the, uh, like they were activated in the lock position. Uh, I can't say I could have recovered all of them. Uh, but, you know, I don't know which ones are interior doors and, and stuff. He just put up. But the detectives told the family they believed the doors were locked. How did her killer get out? It's a question that smolders in the minds of those who still think Nanette set the house on fire, then shot herself even though the science of three autopsies says otherwise. I have good indication to say that yeah, the doors were locked. All the doors. Okay. I can't say 100% all of them. You remember at least two dead bolts that yeah. were locked? You know, she got, it seemed like withdrawn, sad. Nan, you could read her face. You didn't need to find, ask her how she felt about something. You could just see it all over her face. But if the unspoken words in her eyes, on her brow, weren't clear, Nanette's own words were resolute. In June, she texted her sister Kim, quote, I've been praying a lot and it's definitely coming to a head. It just seems like what she was telling us, she wasn't being heard. She had gotten to a point where anytime um, she went anywhere in her car, she had one in her car. She had her Springfield in her purse. And then it went from having one in her purse, in her car, and then in the nightstand. So she told dad, you know, this one goes with me always. I'm always, I'm always safe. In the end, the guns, the cameras, her fortress did not protect her. Her biggest fear came to pass. Now her family, her friends fear they will never find justice for Nanette because of what happened in the hours after she was killed. As we're standing there, I'm taking pictures, I thought, I just did disbelief that there's not, nothing's going to really be able to come from this. I'd like to say that we're, we're doing everything possible. Anytime we're dealing with a fire. This is, a, this is tough. Accident, suicide, whatever. The, the fire was so hot and damaged and destroyed a lot of evidence. Don't heightened sense of alert. With evidence that we do because have and have collected. It could be anything. Uh, we're doing our best. Fire's a great way to cover up a crime. People that, that I know that are that are familiar with investigations say the first 48, 72 hours are very critical. Sarah Pagonis is a reporter with the Times-Picayune New Orleans Advocate. We work a lot together on investigations. And it would just seem to me from some of the things that we've found out that the first 48 to 72 hours are a missed opportunity in this case. The morning of the murder, Nanette went to McDonald's, at least that's what the sheriff's office says. She was alone in the car except for a dog. There was not another person and the police say um, that she was not followed. The sheriff's office has grainy video from a nearby Walgreens of Nanette's car, at least that's what they believe is Nanette's car, ordering at the drive-thru at McDonald's. People who think it's Nanette believe that the motion in the car is 
her little dog, Harley. But other family members are skeptical. They don't believe that it's her. Some of the family thinks it's possible Nanette was killed the night before the fire. We've got Chad and Amy here. Shelby. Shelby's here. Uh, Detective Buckner. A year after Nanette's death, Sheriff Smith showed the video to some of her family members. Others listened in on the phone. We want to release it to the media, but there's some things that came up this morning. Uh, and now watching the video, there was the, the, just some, some cars that were in the drive up behind her. We want to try to see their transactions. And... I mean, why wouldn't we have checked those cars out within the last year? I mean, why are we doing that now? There's a security camera somewhere on this road that captured Nanette coming back to the property at 9, 11 a.m. the morning she died. If it is her in the car, which the sheriff's office and her husband, Steve Krentel, seem confident it is, that was the last time Nanette was seen alive. Her phone records show an outgoing call to Kmart about a prescription at 10.03 a.m. Then a mysterious outgoing phone call from her cell phone. There was roughly an hour before the 911 call was the last phone call from her phone. Uh, and it was to an individual, local individual, who I sat down with and spoke to. And she says, it has to be a missed call. I don't know Nan, never know Nan. Didn't know Steve. So let's talk about the timeline of the investigation. Steve Krentel's fire department truck had what's sometimes called a tattletale camera one that kicks on when the truck goes at a high speed or quickly changes direction. This is video from the day of the fire. You can see the sheriff's units mm -hmm. who were the first to arrive. And then Steve's unit is also the first to arrive, the first fire unit to arrive at the scene. The state fire marshal says they got the call to investigate it at four, two hours later. Hey, this is Steve. Can you get call as soon as you get this police on the cell phone? He told me that Nanette had died that afternoon in a house fire. Dad called and said, Kim, Nanette's dead. And I just, what? And just immediately started screaming, they, they killed her. Pretty much just like this. Because I can handle the science of it. You know, we can talk about the house and all that. But just knowing that she's gone, that was the hardest part. 9 p.m., Nanette's remains are removed. The sheriff's office secures the scene for the night. They find the body, fatal fire. Then it's like, well, where did it start? How did it start? Was it intentionally set? All of those questions are supposed to be answered by the state fire marshal in their investigation. The state fire marshal will only officially say the fire was intentionally set. Sources close to the investigation say they found Nanette laying on her back on the floor of the master bathroom. Her killer doused the DVR that recorded the Krentel surveillance cameras in the living room and parts of the master bedroom with accelerant, then set the fire in at least two places. If there were any clues to what happened to Nanette on that DVR, they were consumed by the fire. Even the FBI could not retrieve the video. 9 a.m., the autopsy. The St. Tammany Parish coroner finds the bullet. Quote, at this time, scene custody became shared or joint among agencies. The scene was released Saturday evening. When do you release the scene back to whoever the scene belongs to? When you're absolutely comfortable that you've got everything. Everything. In the middle of the day, if you sleep normal hours and you're awake, you don't die in a house fire. The thing I mainly remember is them saying it was, it was very complicated, so much fire damage. I look at that scene of the house and just see nothing but ashes. The time and effort it was taking to do a painstaking search through that. There's a rule we have that says the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But it's not like the house suddenly is just burst into flames. Fire can destroy a lot of things, we just don't see them. Everything is a homicide until proven otherwise. 
the whole scene was very, very hot. And um, so we were as close as we could be. Were there but walls left? No walls left, no, nothing. And um, you know, you might have a little remnant of a brick here or there. Amy Bernard is one of Nanette's half sisters. They grew up together in Metairie. She stayed at the fire scene that horrible day until the coroner's office removed Nanette's remains. And they had equipment and they had lights and they had sounded like saws or something. They did a really good job trying to be careful, I think. Because once the scene is handed back to the homeowner, in this case, Steve Krentel, the evidence can be tainted. Two days later, on Monday, Nanette's family arrives from Iowa. And as soon as we pulled up, I pulled Kim aside. I said, this ain't right. This hasn't even, nobody's even investigated this. Kim Watson, Nanette's half-sister, is a criminal prosecutor. Standing there, I'm taking pictures. I thought, I just, it, disbelief. But there's not, nothing's going to really be able to come from this. Rubble and ash was pretty, pretty deep all across that slab. It, it uh, was. I seen the scene Monday morning. I was on it. And um, we also seen a gun in plain sight, an AR style gun that was left behind by the law enforcement. Okay. And, and again, just, it was later recovered. Yes, it was later recovered. And again, we were looking for a uh, handgun and not a uh, long gun. Randy found a gun left behind. Steve Krentel says he questioned the quality of the search too. So he asked a friend to take this drone video and he hired a private arson investigator named Rick Jones. He declined to comment, but sources close to the investigation say Jones found a shotgun and the carcasses of the Krentel's two cats that the fire marshal and the sheriff's office left behind. The uh, fire marshal did their processing with it released it and then we went back under search warrant again after we realized uh, the first two guns collected didn't match the projectile uh, from the autopsy. Steve Krentel says the couple had 30 guns. The sources say investigators left the DVR for the surveillance cameras behind too. So the state fire marshal and the St. Tammany Sheriff's Office re-secured the scene five days later to look for evidence again. Look at the difference in these photos. Steve Krentel says this picture is after the first search on Saturday, and this is after the second search the following Thursday. That's when sheriff's investigators found Nanette's 40 caliber Springfield handgun. Every case is different. You just follow the evidentiary trail. Some are pretty direct, some take quite a while, and they take a lot of twists and turns. But you can't follow the trail of evidence if you haven't collected the evidence. Or had it analyzed, yeah. Detectives told the family Nanette's 40 caliber Springfield could not be ruled out as the murder weapon. She had her Springfield in her purse. That was one her and Steve both got matching. The Krentels liked to target shoot. Their house is on 100 acres of largely wooded land. And so she told dad, you know, this one goes with me always. I'm always, I'm always safe. She felt comfortable. She felt like, I got this, I can protect myself. Protect herself from what? She was afraid and it just said, this is coming to a head. Or who? Nan was scared to death of him. Her family got email after email in the months, weeks, even days leading up to the fire, all fearful of one person. It just seems like what she was telling us, she wasn't being heard. At family dinners, it is as important to note who is there. We really rely on each other. I mean, as it is to note who isn't. People were making her seem crazy, but she wasn't. Both those who can't be there, like Nanette Krentel. What would this dinner be like if, if she was sitting here? It'd be louder and there'd be more laughing. <laughs> If there was something bad going on in her life, she kept that to herself because she wanted everybody else to be happy. And those who are no longer welcome. It has not been easy.
That is Nanette's husband, Steve Krentel, two months after her death. Steve quickly became detectives' primary person of interest in her death. Experts in homicide investigations say that happens often when a woman is killed, they look at the husband. But two months after the fire, in the case of the fire chief's wife, St. Tammany Parish Sheriff Randy Smith took a highly unusual step. At this time, our initial, our initial primary person of interest in this investigation, the victim's husband, has been cleared. Stephen Crintel has been fully cooperative with this investigation from the beginning. To say he's been cleared is pretty strong language. It's pretty unusual. Sarah Pagonis is a reporter with the Times-Picayune New Orleans Advocate. I don't know what prompted that. So what made Smith clear Steve when Nanette's family members have lingering questions? Let's start. Security cameras. Wants new cameras with the cameras. Why is it all of a sudden the cameras weren't working that day? He said nine cameras. Nine cameras around the house. There were multiple All the way cameras. around the house. Two separate camera systems. Both failed to protect her. This is a pretty secured site, if I've ever seen one. The day before the fire, Steve says the wireless device that powered the gate cameras stopped working. He got home late from a parish council meeting that Thursday night. He didn't stop to reboot it because he was tired and wanted something to eat and go to bed. As afraid as she was, she wanted to be able to, okay, well, who's at my gate? Because no one should be back here. They doused the DVR. The DVR that would have shown some footage of movement outside the house. Even the FBI couldn't recover the video from the second camera system. She was armed and afraid. On the day she died, Steve says they had 30 guns. While there were secrets in the Krentel's marriage, Nanette's fear was not one of them. This is a statement she always made. As long as I have my guns and the cameras and I'm at home, I'm safe. Steve installed the cameras to make Nanette feel safe. He also helped install the ones at his fire station that helped with his alibi. Several people at the fire station accounted for him throughout the day. Went and met some people at lunch at Outback, and his phone was plotted back to the fire station where he was there until he got the call about his house on fire. This camera in his fire unit shows Steve pulling up to his burning house with a co-worker. That life-changing day not only cost him his wife and his home, it put all eyes on the fire chief. The day he returned to work after Nanette's death. All for opening an investigation. The fire district board launched a civil service investigation into Steve that would ultimately cost him his job. The allegations included an affair with a woman who worked at the fire district. She had told me that she knew Steve was having an affair. The affair wasn't the only thing that Nanette said caused a strain in their marriage. What she told me, if he doesn't start protecting me from Brian and his family, that I'm kicking him out. Protecting her from Brian Krentel, Steve's brother. Six years before her death, Nanette wrote her dad this email, concerned about Brian's pending release from jail. Quote, when he says, I will start your house on fire and kill you when you come out, that is a serious threat to me. Nan was scared to death of him. Brian has a long criminal record. Court records reveal at least 15 convictions, including three DWIs and battery on a police officer. Brian blamed Steve and Nanette for one of those arrests. He did blame Nanette and Steve for uh, his getting arrested. Two months before her death, Kim says Nanette sent her this text about Brian, quote, he threatened to set the house on fire, rape me, and kill us. Just last month, the family uncovered never-before-seen emails Nanette sent her dad on an old account he had forgotten about, repeating her concerns about Brian. Quote, Brian is capable of anything, and someone that has nothing to lose, is full of hate, uses drugs, makes threats, is a loose cannon. My name is Katie Moore, and I'm a reporter with WWL. We tried multiple times to reach Brian on the phone and even went in person. 
He did a phone interview with YouTube show Crime Watch Daily last year. What was going through your mind when they said that we're looking into you? Um, actually, it didn't really bother me because um, I didn't have nothing to worry about, you know. Uh, I loved her. She was like a sister I didn't have, let's put it that way. <laughs> it's infuriating. Anybody that knew Nanette and knew Brian knew that was not true. But that's not very many people. He has an ankle monitor that gives him a curfew and goes off if he comes within a thousand feet of our house. We know now that's not true. He was on probation at the time of her death wearing a court-ordered ankle monitor. They did not have the GPS turned on. Oh. All they had was the alcohol turned on. The GPS on his tracking device was not turned on. The sheriff's office has not said if Brian is a person of interest or a suspect in the case. Steve put in cameras at his parents' house um, because he believed their safety was in jeopardy with Brian living there. And that entire day, Brian is on video surveillance at the house. I don't think authorities have ever told us anything except that Steve has been cleared and that Brian has an alibi based on cameras. After initially agreeing to an interview, Sheriff Smith later declined, saying, quote, we have spoken with our investigative partners in this case and have decided that we refrain from any further comment on this open, active investigation. We do know both Steve and Brian Krentel willingly took lie detector tests. We're still very interested in, in Brian, for sure. Maybe not him, but someone else to affiliate with. Again, that was in August of 2018. We don't know if they still are. First 48 hours is once again kind of that equivocal stage. Time. We verified it because of the time on the DVR. Time the fire. Or what kind of was the fire is that? set to cover up a, another crime? More often an enemy than a friend. But at the time, time. he was pushing suicide. Tell me that women shoot themselves all the time. Time can be fleeting, even fatal. If you have complete cardiac arrest, you will breathe for five or six minutes afterwards because your brain has enough drive down in the brain stem to control the muscles that will breathe for you. Even this homicide investigation. Even though we didn't realize at the time, she had been shot. Experts say every minute counts. In the weeks before her death, Nanette told Kim the friction with Steve over her fear of Brian was, quote, coming to a head. He just wasn't helping her out emotionally or physically through this difficult time. Time helped give Brian an alibi. They seemed pretty confident at least the way they told us, that Brian was at mom's house at the time of the fire. Surveillance cameras Steve installed inside his mother's home when Brian was released from prison captured Brian the day of Nanette's death. The time displayed on the DVR corresponds with the current time. Sources say a clock on the wall in the video showed the same time as the recorder. In August of 2018, the family questioned whether St. Tammany detectives verified the recording wasn't manipulated. Was that reviewed by the FBI as well? Yeah. Okay. We may have the FBI review that video as well to see if there was any tampering with such the, the hard drive or the video that we seized in a search warrant. Because the sheriff declined an interview, it's unclear whether the FBI ever conducted that forensic exam of the camera recorder. Brian was the first person you talked to at the scene. Yes. She was fearful from what she had told me, so I kind of did think for a minute, well, I mean, I know this is a tragic event here, but um, I did kind of think it was a little odd that he was there and, and he did tell me he was sorry. Even experts say it has been an unusual investigation. When we called to obtain a meeting with the fire marshal, they didn't want to meet with us because they thought we were calling to complain about the way the fire scene was handled. Did you have a reason to complain about how the fire scene was handled? Yes. As they headed back to Iowa, eight days after Nanette's death,
the Watsons were so concerned, they started asking federal investigators to get involved. I knew the sheriff pretty much was going to control things, and we were trying our best to get the FBI involved. The FBI did get involved, as did the ATF and even the U.S. Postal Service. Sheriff Randy Smith brought in former U.S. Marshal Jenny May as a consultant on the investigation as well. We're going to move now to a mystery that police are trying to solve in Louisiana. Louisiana. We'll stop Crime Watch daily, daily from getting the answers. Either didn't know or didn't, didn't care. care. Question, what happened to the wife of a fire chief? The mystery surrounding Nanette's death sparked national interest, from national TV networks to a true crime podcast dedicating hours to taking calls from armchair detectives and people with ties to the case. We were kind of wandering around just looking at everything. Nanette's family has gotten a huge response online, with hundreds of leads they have tracked down and passed along to law enforcement. Does it blow your mind how many people, even on in the Facebook group, oh, man. are trying to solve this? It's amazing. So many people have tried to investigate what happened to Nanette, and one of the things that struck me at dinner tonight was the fact that they said that their group text message that they have with a number of their family members and people who are close friends, they have exchanged a million texts talking about this since Nanette was killed. A million texts. But leads about the case, questions about the investigation haven't just come from the community, but law enforcement with life-changing consequences. Take federal agent for HUD's Office of Inspector General, Jerry Rogers. I remember getting that first email and I didn't, I didn't think a lot about it. Rogers sent the Watsons a series of anonymous emails asking questions about how the case was being handled last year. We were getting so many people I, don't, I want to remain anonymous, but here's what I know. He was critical of the STPSO's lead detective, Danny Buckner, calling him a, quote, stone-cold rookie, something the sheriff has said isn't true. And then it turned into this whole someone going to jail over an email. and The sheriff's detectives started investigating who the anonymous sender was, saying the emails caused members of the victim's family to, quote, lose confidence in the sheriff's office investigation. But all the family members we spoke with say they lost confidence in the investigation long before. There is no confidence at all in the investigation. If I had a valuable piece of evidence, I wouldn't turn it over to Randy Smith. Rogers says three deputies showed up at his door, placed him in handcuffs, and took him to jail on a criminal defamation charge. He has yet to be formally charged with a crime. The St. Tammany DA asked the Louisiana Attorney General to prosecute it because Rogers' wife works for the DA. They noted in their letter to the AG that Louisiana's criminal defamation law has been declared unconstitutional. And so they put these really stringent requirements on um, any law that seeks to punish somebody for something that they say. Again, because the idea that you can be put in jail just for the expression of words is pretty outrageous. Multiple sources close to the investigation have said the FBI's Civil Rights Division is now investigating Roger's arrest for possible violations of his civil rights. At least two detectives say Sheriff Smith forced them out over the Krentel case. One of them, high-ranking financial crimes detective Stephen Montgomery, who has a spotless record. He was working on the Krentel case and he had been consulting with Agent Rogers. The other, Steve Chasson, a cold case detective, who also raised questions about the investigation to the family. A spokesman says Chasson retired at his own request. It continues to erode away any confidence that one might start to build every time they change investigators. Even Steve Krentel hired his own private investigator to look into Nanette's death. He would not share the findings with us, but says he turned everything over to the STPSO. Now, for Nanette's family, it's a matter of time. They can handle the science of it. You know, we can talk about the house and all that. 
but just knowing that she's gone, that was the hardest part. And knowing somebody did this. I don't think her last hours were pleasant. Clearly, they're a grieving family and a determined family, and they want to know what happened. This has not been properly investigated at any level. Waiting just... for someone to say something. They now need answers that transcend the ashes.